Good morning, all. Welcome to worship today. It's been the third Sunday in Lent. We welcome also our online viewers who are worshiping with us this morning. We pray that your worship with us will be mixed with well, a blessing to you and to us as well. Today's service will be led by Pastor Graham Harms. Thank you, Pastor Graham. I knew he was pointing over there for some reason. <laughs> Good morning again. It's good to be here with you in this third Sunday in Lent as we continue our, our walk towards the cross and the resurrection. God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that, that Christ died for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing the hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Friends in Christ, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
We confess that we are born in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. We deserve your eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. Amen. I ask each of you in the presence of God who searches the heart, do you confess that you have sinned and do you repent of your sins? I do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed you from all your sins and do you desire forgiveness in his name? I do. Do you intend with the help of the Holy Spirit to live daily as in God's presence and to strive daily to lead a holy life even as Christ has made you holy? I do. Christ gave to his church the authority to forgive the sins of those who repent. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. And on behalf of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his command, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. Amen. Amen. We sing the song, Nothing But the Blood. Let's pray, the, let's pray the psalm. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods.
He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. Glory Glory to the the Father Father and the Son and and the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was was in the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and and will be forevermore. forevermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray that we live repentant lives. Together. Holy Holy and and merciful God, God, we we thank thank you you for giving giving your Son, Jesus, Jesus, to die die on the cross for our sinners. Turn Turn us us away from from our sins sins and and back back to a life of trust in you. you. We ask ask this through through Christ Christ our Lord who lives lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now now and forever. Amen. We'll hear some readings now from the Word of God. The first reading for today is written in Exodus chapter 17, beginning from verse 1 to verse 7. The Israelites put God to the test. At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin and moved from place to place. Eventually, they camped at Remedim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So once more, the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What should I do with these people? They are ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Walk out in front of the people. Take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. 
Moses named the place Massah, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord here with us or not? This is the Lord, word of the Lord. And the second reading is written in Romans chapter 5, beginning from verse 1 to 11. While we were sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into to problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's rise for the Holy Gospel. And the Gospel for this day is written in the Gospel according to St John, chapter 4, beginning at verse 5. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptising and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptise them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Well, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband for you've had five husbands and, you're out, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, 
you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on the mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while, he, while we were gone? The disciples asked one another. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work. And now you will get to gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the saviour of the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the living water of eternal life. Help us to believe in you and, and to worship God in spirit and in truth. We'll be seated for the next song.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. But the time is coming, in fact the time has arrived, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. My dear, dear friends in Christ, the well was one of the key social meeting places of the ancient world, the ancient village. Women came there every day to draw water for the needs of their households. And while they were there, they naturally caught up on the news of their neighbours. It was often the daughters of the house who were sent there for that purpose. And so it was there that young men would sometimes also turn up on the off chance. Jesus also heads for the well since it is the place to meet people. He sent his disciples off into the village to buy food. And when a woman arrived to draw water, he asked for a drink. She was surprised that he would even talk to her, let alone accept drinking water from her hand. Jews had a very low opinion of the people of this part of the land of ancient Israel. These people were descended from people who had escaped from the Babylonian exile by hiding in the hills and intermarrying with the local tribes. They represented a sort of rival claim to be the people of God and the Jews hated them. They worshipped the same God, but on Mount Gerizim, whereas any good Jew knew that God only wanted to be worshipped on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. All non-Jews were thought of as unclean, but Samaritans even more so. What follows in this conversation is thoroughly remarkable, given the attitudes of the day. And the disciples were certainly astonished to find their teacher deep in conversation with this local woman when they returned with food. Because Jesus engaged her in dialogue, not as a chance acquaintance at a, at a well, but as a person. Everyone knew the Samaritans were not persons, according to the Jews. Jesus engaged her in dialogue, took her seriously, and ended up by challenging her so deeply and impressing her so thoroughly that she gathered all her friends and neighbours together to join the conversation. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Jesus breaks social barriers to find people. He often ate with tax collectors and prostitutes, the people excluded from normal social contacts in, in his own circles. Jesus called his own righteousness into question by identifying with them and welcoming them to his table fellowship. You can imagine that the disciples might have been a bit iffy about that too. Now a Samaritan woman, what next? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If she starts off puzzled, she is even more confused when he tells her that he could give her living water. There is a word play here. In the normal language of the day, living water means running water. Where was Jesus going to get running water? Does he think he's any better than Jacob and his sons who dug this well? But then there is the literal sense of the term water of life, which implies water which gives life. Jesus is referring to himself, of course. He is God's gift to sinful humanity, the one who satisfies our thirst for life, our search for meaning, our search for truth. But the gift of God, which the disciples are later to be asked to wait for, is the Holy Spirit. This woman doesn't know the Holy Spirit, doesn't know the Son of God, and so she offers a drink instead of asking for one. This points to another key aspect of God's relationship with us. He is and always wants to be the giver. If we want to do his will, we accept his gifts gratefully and without trying to take his place. This woman wants to see herself in the place of the giver. Maybe she even thinks of herself as taking the higher moral ground 
She doesn't discriminate against Jews the way they do. Jesus turns it around and points her to a gift which she needs to receive. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw water again. She takes the surface meaning again and misses the point. She wants to get rid of the drudgery of daily housework, drawing water and carrying heavy jars from the well to the house. What a labour-saving device this Jesus is turning out to be. Or is there a hint of sarcasm in her voice? Ah, oh, yeah, I bet. Jesus changes the subject and takes the conversation to a deeper level. He penetrates the superficial chatter to get to the heart of the matter. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. The woman's answer is a half-truth that is meant to hide the deeper reality of her life from Jesus. Unlike her, Jesus doesn't take the surface meaning but looks beneath and finds the truth. He said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Is it her sin which Jesus is exposing or is he touching her in the way in which she has sinned against? Perhaps both. In any case, he is only interested in things as they are, in people as they are. You and I, for the sake of civil conversation and an easier life, tend to avoid this kind of questioning. But it is only now that she is faced with herself as she, herself as she is. She loses the high ground and is forced to confront the lack of rightness in herself. Nothing she didn't know before, of course, but here is a fellow human being with whom she can face this reality as a conversation partner. But it is too hard this time round. She changes the subject and falls back on religion to avoid the truth. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You worship what you do not know, says Jesus. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Salvation is from the Jews. The woman cannot retreat into pretense. She needs to recognise the truth. But the truth is in the person who sits in front of her, not in religious arguments between Jews and Samaritans, both relics of the theological past, both former parties to the covenant, but now superseded. Salvation comes through the Jews. But what does that count for? There is a new reality to deal with. He goes on, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus ushers in a new order of worship, a universal order which is not tied to a specific nation or ethnic group or mountain or temple. But the new thing is not that God is to be worshipped all over the place or perhaps in the great Australian outdoors. Spirit and truth are not airy fairy devotions in the never-never. Spirit is the Holy Spirit who has been alluded to twice already in this conversation. God is the one who comes to us who engenders faith in us and who inspires our worship. Indeed, this new order of worship is not a human initiative, which this religious argument almost seems to suggest. Where, where do we decide to worship God? Rather, the God whom we worship is the one who takes the initiative in worship. 
who speaks to us and touches us through word and sacrament, who acts in our lives and provides us with the words to say in our daily witness to his love. It's a question of the Holy Spirit. And truth in this passage should also have a capital letter. For it is Jesus himself who is the way, the truth and the life, who is the focus of our worship. We worship the Father through the Son by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That is worship in spirit and truth. The Greek suggests that those two are joined, a joined reality that can't be separated. Spirit and truth belong together. Of course, like the woman at the well, we are also confronted with the truth about ourselves. We approach the throne of grace as sinners, openly confessing our sinful nature before God and one another, as we did again this morning. As sinners and receivers, we recognise the truth of our situation before God and live in truth by not trying to take God's place or pretend that we are something that we are not. Thus we confess. We wait in confident expectation for God's healing and forgiveness. We walk in the path that lies before us without the need to pretend or posture, content merely to be forgiven sinners with the promise of new life. Is that where the woman ended up, perhaps? She said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he, one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will show us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Now her attention is finally directed to the one who is promised. And Jesus assures her that she has met him. No longer so confident in her theological opinions, now her certainties are turned into a single question. Can this be the Christ? She is so filled with this one question that she leaves her water jar at the well. I'm sure she will sheepishly return to recover it when she realises what she has done. But her attention has been so completely turned outside herself that she forgets one of the most important pieces of household equipment that she owns. Can this be the Christ? Yes, and the way, and the truth, and the life. She can drink at this fountain and never thirst, and so can you. In truth, in the spirit, that can be a struggle to so turn away from our own self-orientation that we are lost in the receiving of gifts. But that is what Jesus offers, and that's what he offers you today. And the peace of God, which is beyond all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to confess with me our Christian faith and the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We'll stand to do that. Together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll be seated to sing the next song. pray together the offering prayer. Lord, Lord you, you have given, given so much, much to us. us. Help, Help us, us to show in our deeds the faith you have planted, planted within us. Make, Make us ready to serve you and other people with all that we are and all that we have. Amen. When God gave us the gift of his Holy Spirit, called us to pray to him as our Father. Let us pray to him in the name of Jesus for the church, the world and those in need. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus gives us the living water of his saving word and holy baptism. Keep us close to him by staying close to the scriptures and the church. Lord, in your mercy, give, give us, us the water, water of life. We pray for all people preparing for baptism or confirmation at this time. Lead them in your truth and give them confidence in confessing you before others. Lord, in your mercy, give, give us, us the water of life. Bring justice to people who are wrongly treated by others. Curb violence and crime and bring peace to all nations and communities. Lord, in your mercy, give, give us, us the water, water of life. life. Heavenly Father, teach our world the truth about marriage and the blessing you give through it. Give your grace, grace and strength to all married couples and help them fulfil their marriage vows that they would always seek to serve and forgive each other. Lord, in your mercy, give, give us, us the water, water of life. Supply all people with the water they need for daily life and remo remove disease and famine. Be with us as well in our need for rain. Lord, in your mercy, give, give us the water of life. Bring healthy births to women expecting children. Comfort those who face the loss of loved ones and provide for all in need, including those known personally to us 
and then we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, give us us the water of life. Father, you give your spirit to those who ask you. Pour out your spirit on us to refresh us and bring us to life in you. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing to him, feed us now. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good, Lord God, Holy Father, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has taken on himself our sin so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And so with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we adore and praise your glorious name. Holy, holy, holy holy Lord, God of power power and might, heaven and and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Our Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your Your kingdom kingdom come. come. Your Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Gracious Father, we therefore remember the sacrifice of our Lord in celebration as we receive his body and blood with this bread and wine. We rejoice to receive all that he has done for us in his life and death, his resurrection and ascension. And we wait for his coming again to share with us the heavenly feast. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we who receive the body and blood of Christ may live as true members of the body of your Son. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thanks be to God. Come, everything is now ready. Let's pray. Lord God, our strength, battle of good and evil rages within and around us. Through this holy meal, 
strengthen our faith in your Son. And when we fall, raise and restore us. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May Christ, our crucified Saviour, draw you to himself, so that you may find in him the assurance of sins forgiven and the gift of eternal life. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Christ has reconciled us to God and will save us. Thanks be to God. The last hymn will be seated. Thank you.